I want to welcome you to the 2023 mid-year public safety briefing here for the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department. It's hard to believe, but we are more than halfway through 2023. You're going to hear today in depth about crime trends and CMPD's responses to property crime, violent crime, and to juveniles. You'll also hear about some legislative updates and an update on recruiting here at CMPD also. While we're pleased to announce that violent crime has continued to drop in Charlotte, property crime has maintained an increase so far this year. Overall crime in Charlotte is up 11% this year. That overall number is made up of a decrease of 8% in violent crime and an increase of 16% in property crime. If these trends sound familiar, it's because you've heard similar trends before, even recently, end of year 2022, first quarter of 2023, and then now mid-year in 2023, the overall trends are generally the same, but the main driver of overall crime continues to be the same, and that is auto theft. The Hyundai and Kia thefts should come as no surprise to anyone at this point. We've been talking about them quite a bit for about a year now, but it's still a very real, real problem and that's here in Charlotte and nationwide. Our first speaker today is Deputy Chief Stephen Brochu. That's B-R-O-C-H-U. He's gonna to come to share more about violent crime this year and um, some information about juveniles that we're seeing. Chief. Thank you, LT. Good morning, everybody. I have to break out the reading glasses. It's just getting that time. <clears throat> From uh, January 1st to June 30th of this year, CMPD has had a total of 262,000 police interactions. That includes citizens initiated calls for service and officer initiated CAT events. This number stays relatively flat uh, from last year. As you heard Lieutenant Petrus point out, there's been an 11% increase in overall crime this quarter compared to the same period last year. While the statement is correct, a significant portion of this rise can be attributed specifically to our auto thefts. And in fact, if you reduced or took out auto thefts entirely from the equation, both the last year and this year, our overall crime numbers would equate to 0.4% reduction. <clears throat> In a few minutes, you're going to hear Major Thomas, and he's going to talk specifically about our auto thefts and our property crimes. Looking at our violent crime statistics this year, we're down 8% overall in violent crime. We're showing a decrease in every single category, starting with homicides. We're down 15%. That's 45 compared to 53. Robbery is down 14%. 733 incidents to 631. Rapes also down 26%. And our aggravated assaults are down 5%. Out of 7,744 arrests this year, 865 have been attributed directly to violent crime. We've taken 1,784 guns off the street. I'll say it again, 1,784 guns. That's up an increase of 8% from last year. That's a credit and great work to our task force members, and you've heard us talk many times about our crimes gun suppression team. We credit the decrease in violent crime in our community to a range of initiatives. We're contributing this effort to include actively seeking input and engagement from our community, employing a strategic approach to resource and how we deploy those resources, leveraging an advanced crime analysis techniques and technology to monitor crime trends. You hear us talk a lot about our crime gun suppression team as well as task force members getting guns off the street, but today I wanna to highlight a particular unit that's spread within our patrol divisions called the Crime Reduction Unit. Crime reduction units work every day to reduce violent crime. Specifically, they work to identify and target high crime areas. They conduct surveillance and gather intelligence. They make arrests as well as seize illegal weapons and also work with community partners to prevent crime. Let me give you a few examples of the fantastic work that you hear or may not have heard yet from our crime reduction units. Starting out in our Westover division, they've been working an initiative to respond to citizen complaints as well as shooting incidents. As a result of this initiative, they seized 18 firearms. Seven of those firearms were stolen. They made 12 arrests as a result of those uh, recoveries, 
And due to that, in part, some of those firearms through our NIBIN and crime lab were identified having been involved in other crimes. Hickory Grove Division worked a case involving a suspect who threatened multiple U.S. postal employees. They identified that suspect who was a convicted felon, also in possession of a firearm, arrested that suspect. A subsequent search warrant led to five additional firearm recoveries. Meeting in the Independence Division, that crime reduction unit located an arrested subject who had out outstanding arrest warrants for possession of firearm by felon and shooting in the city limits, executing a search warrant, going back and seizing five additional firearms. North Division Crime Reduction Unit recently assisted with a search warrant that led to a seizure of 17 firearms and over $5 million worth of stolen goods. And then finally, in our North Tryon Division, so far this year, 120 firearms and made 116 arrests. Just talking through their commander, they're already ready to surpass last year's numbers in both arrests as well as seizures. We, de we credit this decrease in crime due to a number of initiatives, uh, efforts including actively seeking input from our community, employing a strategic approach, and leveraging advanced crime analysis techniques. And I got a page wrong. <clears throat> I appreciate the work that Crime Reductions Unit, and I have no doubt they play a part and a significant role in the community and the, the uh, crime reductions that they serve. In the end, I want to talk about juveniles and their impact in overall crime. We have a 29% increase in juvenile arrests this year. Despite a 10% decrease in violent crimes committed by juveniles, they still account for a significant portion of property crimes. This year, there's been a staggering 93% increase in juvenile involvement in property crimes. It's a 93% increase in their involvement in overall property crimes compared to the previous year. And again, with our auto thefts being the major contributing factor. All right, with that, I'll turn it back over to LT. Thank you, sir. So you just heard Deputy Chief Bershu um, speak a little bit to the juvenile crime trends that we're seeing. Uh, Major Jonathan Thomas, T-H-O-M-A-S, is going to come now to share more about juvenile crime and um, property crime, specifically auto theft. Major. Thanks, Lieutenant. Before I get into the numbers, I'd like to pick up right where Deputy Chief Brochu left off of juvenile and auto thefts. Property crime is up 16%, with a large portion of that being vehicle thefts. There has been a 143% increase in auto thefts this year alone. This is the largest increase in this category that we have ever seen. From January 1st through June 30th, 3,717 people have had their cars stolen. That's 3,717 people that have been put in situations where they could not get to work or drive their kids to school or go to the grocery store because someone took away their transportation. This is happening all over the city with our central division having the Many of our offenders repeatedly steal cars after being caught multiple times. and the suspect often escalates their auto thefts into other crimes like burglary that are driving 108 miles per hour in that stolen car on Charlotte City streets. Another time he stole an auto at a QT gas station was observed on video on camera getting in and out of the vehicle. Each of these times he was denied a secure custody order released to his parents. His crime spree ended on July 9th when Juvenile X, along with four other co-defendants, carjacked a man with his minor child in the car. He was arrested at that one and a secure custody order was granted and he is now in custody and awaiting trial. Many of our juvenile offenders are committing multiple crimes before a secure custody order is granted. On many cases, we have not seen, a we have not seen arrest and release to parents as an effective deterrent to crime. 
This issue is one of the CMPD's biggest concerns when working to stop these thefts. Year to date, we have made 520 arrests in auto thefts, which is up, which is up 91%. Of those arrests, 373 have been juvenile offenders. That means 72% of the auto thefts arrest citywide are juveniles. It's not just cars being stolen. 612 firearms were taken from those vehicles during this year. And these guns taken from these cars are being used to commit other crimes. CMPD is trying to be proactive to stop auto thefts. We've worked with auto dealers, apartment complexes, and other businesses to help give out approximately 2,000 steering wheel locks so far this year. Our crime analysis division updates officers daily on where the hotspots are, and that's where we direct our patrols to prevent these thefts. CMPD also hosts numerous programs in the summer targeting juvenile age groups in the hope of keeping them away from, from these crimes and gaining positive role models uh, before they lead to crime. Vehicle thefts aside, burglaries, including both residential and property, have gone down by a strong 13%, while larcenies have gone up by 4% and larcenies from auto 11%. Um, once again, our data shows a substantial increase of 93% of juvenile suspects of property crime compared to the previous year. This increase is partially driven in the last several years by the increase of the juvenile age from 16 to 18. That changed in 2019. Uh, thank you, and I'm going to turn it back over to Lieutenant Petrus. Thank you, Major. So just last week, Governor Cooper signed the Pretrial Integrity Act. Uh, you heard Chief Jennings just uh, on Friday speak about this, and, and you heard how excited we are for, for this law to go into effect on October 1st. But there's been some other important legislative changes in North Carolina recently that's going to have an impact on law enforcement statewide. Major Dave Johnson is going to come now to tell you more about some of those changes. Sir. Thank you, Lieutenant. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> I'm here today to talk about two pieces of recently uh, ratified legislation that is going to have a positive impact, a tremendous positive impact for both CMPD and the citizens of Charlotte. In 2023, you've heard us talk a lot about uh, street takeovers. Uh, this is when a group of individuals gather on public streets or in parking lots to engage in reckless driving, stunts, illegal street racing. During these gatherings, uh, these drivers often block traffic, perform dangerous stunts like burnouts, donuts, uh, and perform uh, street racing activity. If uh, th this atmosphere just creates an atmosphere of, of absolute chaos and lawlessness <clears throat> and disruption, this brazen activity obviously poses significant risk to public safety. These takeovers have been a nationwide phenomenon and the Charlotte area has certainly not been immune uh, to this activity. Our officers and, and detectives and analysts have been working hard to help control and enforce the street takeover activity. In the course of our targeted enforcement uh, so far this year, we have made 25 arrests, issued 107 citations, seized 12 firearms, and towed 69 vehicles. You'll see a sample of those vehicles, uh, I believe, in the graphic behind me. We may have already shown that. There it is. That one, that one warms my heart uh, to see that. So up until now, uh, there has been no law targeting specifically this uh, reckless behavior. Participants are simply charged with reckless driving, uh, and there are no consequences for people that uh, attend, spectate, or organize these types of activities. This did not give our officers the proper enforcement tools to make sure that all the participants uh, in this type of activity are held accountable. Thankfully, brand new and much needed legislation just signed by Governor Cooper on Monday will allow officers to hand out stricter penalties with the hope of deterring drivers, spectators, and event organizers from continuing this dangerous and reckless behavior on our city streets. Under this new legislation, a first-time offender will be charged with a Class A1 misdemeanor, which is the highest level misdemeanor, and face a fine of no less than $1,000. Any subsequent offenses uh, within 24 months will be charged as a Class H felony, and the minimum fine goes up to a value that is twice the value of the vehicle used in this activity. Anyone caught organizing one of these events can be charged uh, with a Class A1 misdemeanor. Those who participate in this activity by blocking traffic with their vehicle or standing in the street to uh, film videos to post on social media can also be charged with a Class 3 misdemeanor with subsequent violations being elevated to class two and class one 
misdemeanors. And perhaps most importantly, vehicles used in these types of events will be seized and held pending trial of the offenders uh, of the persons operating the vehicle. And if that person is found guilty, the vehicle will be sold at public auction. We're hopeful that this new tool will aid in combating street takeovers and make those who would participate in such activities think twice. I'd like to personally thank uh, State Representative Carolyn Logan of Mecklenburg County for her work uh, with us in getting the ball rolling on this legislation and helping to get it passed. The second piece of newly ratified legislation I want to highlight is House Bill 140, which authorizes civilian traffic investigations. According to 2021 North Carolina traffic crash statistics, 276,000 traffic crashes were reported across the state. Of that number, nearly 200,000, or 72% of those accidents, did not involve fatalities, personal injury, DWI, or any criminal charges. In 2022, CMPD responded to just over 42,000 traffic crashes, an average of 115 per day. As you can imagine, these crashes impose a tremendous workload, especially for large cities like ours, for what in many cases uh, amounts to a data collection report for the insurance companies. This law authorizes municipalities to employ civilian personnel to investigate traffic crashes involving property damage only. These civilian employees will be called civilian traffic investigators. These investigators will respond to minor traffic accidents and complete a report just the same as if it were completed by a law enforcement officer. They would not carry a firearm or have the authority to arrest or write citations, and their uniforms and vehicles will clearly distinguish them from police officers. However, they will have the same authority as an officer to tow or remove a vehicle that is obstructing traffic. These new investigators will be required to attend a training program that will be designed by the North Carolina Justice Academy and spend at least four weeks in the field training under a police officer in how to investigate traffic accidents. It's important to note, however, that this would not supplement or replace any of the city's existing sworn police officers or reduce the number of sworn law enforcement officers employed by a city. The purpose would be to lessen the burden on police agencies statewide allowing for properly trained civilians to investigate property damage traffic collisions, freeing up police officers to respond to higher priority calls. This statute was ratified on June the 15th and became law on July the 1st. We at CMPD are currently exploring how to best implement this new opportunity in our jurisdiction, uh, and we hope to have more news on this front uh, for you very soon. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Major. Some important and exciting legislation coming down for North Carolina. We appreciate it. Um, the final update we want to share with you today is on the topic of recruitment. Chief Jennings has been explicit about his direction for CMPD and the top priorities. Among those are reducing violent crime and recruitment. The CMPD recruiting division continues to look for ways to engage, attract, and hire quality candidates for the position of police officer. We are pleased to report that the number of applications for the position of police officer has risen 10% this year compared to this same time last year in 2022. Additionally, the number of hires for the position of police officer here at CMPD has increased 10% year to date also. In addition to that, for the position of police officer, our human resources division and communications division have done a great job in recruiting equally talented folks to come in for the positions uh, of non-sworn roles here at CMPD. Currently, we have fewer than 25 vacancies out of the 518 non-sworn positions that we have allocated here at CMPD. I'm also proud to report that the communications division is now fully staffed. Even with that good news though, we will continue to recruit for that position to ensure that the 911 calls that we receive, receive the best service possible. I do wanna point out that with the adoption and impl implementation of the New Year's fiscal budget, the starting salary for police officer with no previous experience is now over $56,000. And that's in addition to some other financial incentives for education, military, and secondary language that are available to those police officers also. So, for example, 
a officer with no previous experience, but that comes in with a four-year college degree, will now earn $62,000. We're also still offering the $7,500 hiring bonus, um, and that includes for uh, that, that's applicable to new officers and lateral officers. So, if there's anyone watching today who is interested in working at CMPD, or just pursuing a career that has um, that has purpose, we would love to have you join us. I invite you to go to our recruitment website, which is joincmpd.com. Again, that's joincmpd.com for answers to many questions, and, and you can also submit your application there. We have an academy class that's going to start in October, so now is a perfect time here in July to submit your applica application to, uh, to save your seat in that class. So to wrap up, we understand that we still have work to do in the area of recruitment, but it's great to know that we're trending in a very positive direction, which helps ensure a safer city for all who work, live, and visit here in Charlotte. We're excited at the progress that's been made to find the next generation of CMPD officers and employees. So in just a moment, we're gonna open it up to questions. I ask that, that our speakers um, join me near the podium here. Um, if you have any questions for Deputy Chief Brochu, Major Thomas, or Major Johnson, we'll take those now. I just ask that you, you know, I just identify yourself uh, when you ask the question, identify what outlet you are with, and um, also identify who your question is for specifically, if you can. I'll take the first one. Sir, go ahead. Uh, Hunter with Channel 9. Uh, juvenile crime, whoever can really answer it. Um, I know that with the July 4th thing, you guys really held parents accountable for the actions that happened out there at Romero Bearden. And I just ask, at what point, if not already, will it be an idea brought forth to hold parents responsible for the juvenile crime, whether it's the auto thefts that are happening or even gun-related crimes of 16, 17-year-olds? Thanks, Hunter. So the question is about holding parents accountable more broadly for, for crimes committed by their children, um, especially in the area of property crime. Major. July 4th was not the first time we had, we had done that. That was probably the highest total. Um, or the, in, a, in a large event, but throughout the year, uh, we, we have charged them when, when we get the repeat case of a juvenile. And, and we take into consideration, if, if the parent is working and, and trying to do their best, you know, not likely of getting charged, but if we see that that parent is not doing what they should be to keep that child from rep repetitively breaking the law, that's when they'll get charged. But you know, like I said, July 4th was not the first time. We've used it for gun crimes. We've used it for auto thefts throughout the year. Um, and it's something that we are going to keep keep doing until we can we can stem the behavior. Yeah, it alludes to my next question. What do you want parents to know, especially during these summertime months, that you knowing that you have used this tactic in the past? The parents are responsible for their children. Um, when your child leaves to go downtown, uh, if you know just some of the things that were causing problems, why are they carrying a large book bag? What's in your child's room? Uh, when when we see a child that's been you know 13, 14, 15 year old arrested. And when officers are going into their rooms and finding multiple firearms, when your child's not home at midnight and they're out breaking into cars or stealing cars, um, you're responsible as a parent to keep up with your child. Um, you should at least be able to control what's in their room. Um, we know that it's tough being a parent for a lot of these kids. There's a lot of outside influences that, that, that have more power over the kid than the parents do. And that's why we do say there are parents out there begging us for help, just like with these secure custody orders. We have parents begging us, please put them in custody, and we can't. That's not our part of the justice system. And that's where we do want to get those parents help, and we want to empower the parents that maybe haven't been doing what they're supposed to do and give them those expectations like you're talking about, and that's where we can start lowering these crimes. Sounds like you deal with this a lot. Lexi Wilson with WCNC Charlotte. Is this discouraging, and what is the solution? Uh, it, it's discouraging, but the number that I threw up of juvenile arrests, it's not, well, let's see, let's see if I said 500 juveniles. It's not 500 bad juveniles. A lot of those are repeat offenders. If we can change just a few, we could probably list the top 20 and knock out 300 crimes. And if we can get them to change their habits, that's what we're looking for. We don't want to put them in the system. I'm not happy when we have to put a juvenile 
into custody. And that's when the ch law changed for where they wouldn't get arrested from 16 to 18. The, it had good intentions, but there's a lot of effects like this rise in juvenile crime that we've seen from it. But we do want the children to recognize, or the juveniles, there are consequences to breaking the law. That's why even in some of their interviews, they're telling us, man, I don't get in trouble. I'm going to keep doing it. And that's where it gets disheartening as a police officer. Major Bobo is from Queen City News. Um, will you start using this charging or citing parents for these auto crimes? I mean, the auto crimes keep going up. We already are you guys doing that. We have been all year. Um, and like I said, it's a case by case basis. We're not looking to, like I said, there's a lot of parents that are struggling. We're not using this as another punishment for them. They're already dealing with a kid who's in trouble. But when we see neglect, when we see them meet the elements, their actions were neglectful enough for charging, they will be charged. Jordan Kudish with Spectrum News. So I know you guys got rid of the juvenile detention center. Um, what is um, the next steps for those kids that are, you know, creating those violent crimes? Are they going to some kind of, is it like a probation, a house arrest? What is the next steps for that? We don't run juvenile detention. It, 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 that's ran by the state and right. the justice system through that. Um, and just that one case, you know, Juvenile X that I brought up, he was already on electronic monitoring. In many cases, we're not seeing electronic monitoring as being an effective deterrent either. Uh, it's like I said, anything we can do to get them out of the life of crime, any kind of resources we can give the parent to get them to get off of that track of crime or not go into it in the first place, like all the camps we run during the summer. Um, when they raise the age of juveniles from the 16, uh, or excuse me, from 16 to 18, the entire system that was already overloaded with like the detention facilities was hit with an either larger population. So I think that was a big hit to the system because, like I said, it was a well-intentioned law that wasn't thought out for all the repercussions that would happen like this. I have one more question. When it comes to social media, how big of a role is this playing with our minors to be involved in crime? I think in many times it's a negative influence. We've seen incidents at the park and everything where you see a large gathering, but it's almost encouraging criminal activity in that. There's Instagram or TikTok pages about groups stealing Kias and Hyundais, and they brag about it. They show the videos that they're using on that, and, and, and it's a game to them. And that's why we see it as a negative sometimes, these repetitive offenders, when they're just released to parents and they're bragging about getting caught and they're bragging on Instagram and, and social media, that something has to be done that they see this is serious. They can hurt other people. They like say going 108 miles an hour down a city street in Charlotte, you're going to kill somebody. Or we've had the instances, uh, I think we've had it, I know of at least one juvenile who was in a stolen car who died when he wrecked the car. They're driving crazy and they end up hurting themselves and others. So uh, it's it's been a negative influence. And it's another point of, you know, the parents, look at what your kids have on social media. Deter the bad actions when you can. I have a violent crime question as far as homicide. It's not every one of these that homicides are down, especially in the summer. So I just wanted to know, besides, you know, past the community engagement and such, um, what do you believe is working to help reduce the homicides that we see in this in the city? So most of my talk had, at the end of it, gun seizures. So the number of guns we're encountering on the street and seizing guns and interrupting those is really contributing to the lack of, you know, people go out and argue and they're settling it with a firearm. If we can remove the firearm effectively in that individual, then that is definitely contributing and being a reduction to vile crime. I think <clears throat> that focusing on the offender and the right people, interrupting that cycle. Um, we have people shooting into homes, shooting into cars. Um, some are near misses that could have been very quick, you know, a homicide, and it was just happened to be a miss, or they were saved in the hospital. So interrupting those shooting cycles, which our crime gun is doing, our task force units are doing, as I told, our crime reduction units and patrol, everyone is focused specifically on violent crime in order to interrupt that cycle. Thank you. We'll follow up. Just on the street takeover, Bill, um, how much will this help you? going forward, I mean, being able to not only cite people watching, people organizing, um, things like that. Tremendously, because, the, you know, this is a coordinated event when they when they go out and take over these intersections. You'll have cars that are blockers, uh, folks that are out of their cars filming, and, and a lot of times that creates a situation where the, the people doing the stunts are able to slither out and get away. Uh, so now those folks that are left behind will face uh, some significant charges 
as well. So it just it just opens up an opportunity for us that we think we'll be able to have a significant impact. And the work that we've been doing has already had a significant impact in reducing the activity here in Charlotte. We would see, you know, back earlier in the year, we'd see two or 300 cars at an event. We're lucky if we get 20 to 50 cars at an event. We're seeing them pushed out to other jurisdictions. We're having other jurisdictions contact us to find out, hey, how are you preventing this? What are you doing right? So we're sharing that information with those jurisdictions as well. And, uh, and, and we're already seeing an impact, but we know this is going to help us even more. For the civilian traffic investigators, yes. I know there was a lot of um, different opinions when this was first an idea. First off, how many, even if it's a rough number, is CMPD looking to hire? Is it just a couple or is it dozens? As many as we can do effectively, right, and safely. We want to make sure that the right people are in those positions, right, that they're properly equipped and trained. Um, so we're, we're exploring what all that looks like, right? There's a lot that goes into what's their uniform going to look like? What's the car going to look like? Um, there are other states that have been doing this for a long time. Florida has been doing this for a really long time. So there's, there are models for us to follow, uh, but we're, we're excited about the, the opportunity. Um, and then the, the timeline, I know it's still exploring it, but is there a rough timeline of when the department would like to start implementing this? I mean, by the end of the year, we'd love to have, you know, our first ones out and, and working and um, definitely, if not just on a trial basis, right, so that we can tweak it. It'll be a work in progress uh, for a while, but uh, as soon as we have some more information on that and we're able to start hiring, we'll, we'll certainly come back and let you know. Is that going to be worked into the budget? I mean, with the that's another piece of it, right? I mean, yeah. Right. So those allocations would have to be created, right? We have to work with the city to create those allocations, job descriptions, and all of that. So all of that takes time. The impact. I know you you talked about it um, before here, but truly, I mean, what will this do for officers? I know that recruitment, even though it looks like you guys are making progress, is still an uphill battle. What will it do for your patrol units out there? Well, hopefully it frees them up to, to right, address those higher priority calls for service, right? It's totally unacceptable if someone's facing an emergency or a crisis that they have to wait for a police officer to show up on scene. So uh, we want to free officers up to be able to respond quickly to those emergency calls. That's, you know, when people call 911, they expect a response, and we want to be able to give it to them. Hi, right, very good. Thank you again all for being here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to, to report out today to you all. We uh, take very seriously the responsibility of public safety, and um, we, we're, we're committed to continuing the work in violent crime that we've been able to achieve while also chipping away at um, the violent, or I'm sorry, the property crime trends that we've seen. We have a media release out to you with, with the information that you've, that you've heard today and that you've seen in the slides, so hope you'll uh, take a look at that. Thanks for being here.